<laughs> okay, uh, we can get started. Before we get into the content, let me just briefly remind everyone to please, if you haven't already, fill out your lab preferences today. Uh, I'm planning on getting all of that organized this afternoon, mostly. So uh, if you could please just go onto the website, either indicate the folks with whom you'd like to work or indicate that you'd like to be assigned to a group, and I'll get that all sorted um, this afternoon. And I'll figure out a way to communicate those groups. I think it'll probably be Canvas, probably. Uh, let me briefly remind you what we're doing. So I will remind you that what we've been doing in class for the past couple of lectures is within the repository that contains the course demo code, we've been incrementally working our way up to the example project from which you will start your week two checkout on Wednesday for the Wednesday folks. Uh, in particular, we've been going through this lab one incremental code. We started with a, a blinky demo, just blinking an LED, and used that as the mechanism by which we introduced the CSDK and this whole notion of the, we introduced all of the software, hardware levels of abstraction in this system and talked a little bit about the peripherals that are available. And then last time we spent quite a bit of time talking through this timer interrupt direct digital synthesis demo. And what we talked through in particular last time was the sort of infrastructure that's included in this code. So for instance, how we set up and configure an SPI channel, how we set up and configure a timer interrupt, that kind of thing. And what I waved my hands at last time was the algorithm that this example is actually implementing, which is an algorithm called direct digital synthesis. This is the algorithm that we'll use in lab one to synthesize cricket chirps. And so what I wanna to do today is go back and fill in that gap for this demo and talk about the algorithm that's being implemented here. And I'll mention too, before I get started on the content here that this is a good one to know as far as algorithms go. You could maybe come up with some metric for the power of an algorithm that's something like, you know, the ratio of what it delivers versus what it costs in terms of resources, resources like memory or computation or something. This one is like off the charts. So what it delivers is it allows for you to synthesize a waveform, in particular, in our case, a sine wave of a desired frequency. So say you want to synthesize a sine wave of 400 hertz. It allows for you to do that to within fractions of fractions of fractions of hertz. We'll look at the resolution today. And what it costs you in terms of resources is we're going we're gonna to store the amplitude of one period of a sine wave of in uh, an int array, it's 256 elements long, 256 ints, that's like, what, a little over a kilobyte? You could actually get away with less than that, as we'll see. Um, but we just store that information and access it. We never actually manipulate it in runtime. And then as the algorithm's running, the whole, the, the whole algorithm consumes two lines of code and the most expensive line in either, of, or the most expensive operation in either of those two lines of code is I think an add. So it costs you almost nothing. And what it delivers is this amazing ability to synthesize sine waves of a desired frequency for things like audio synthesis or for other applications. And I'll talk about some other applications today. Um, so the way that I wanna talk about this is I'm gonna start with sort of the central abstraction that underlies this algorithm. And then I'll introduce the steps of the algorithm itself and then go back and substantiate the steps that require substantiation. So let me start by just briefly reminding you what a sine wave is, because maybe it's something that folks haven't thought about in a little bit. So what I'll remind you is what a sine wave is, is the rotate, it's the projection of some rotating phaser onto the imaginary axis, the vertical axis. So what we're seeing here is this phaser in red rotating around and as it rotates, we are, uh, it's projection onto the imaginary axis is shown in green and streaming out of this is a sine wave, right? So stuff that you all know, but maybe it's worthwhile to remind you. Um, we could describe the position of this phaser. We have a few options as far as describing the position of this phaser. We might, for instance, say that it's located at, oh, 45 <coughs> degrees. We might alternatively say that it's located at pi over four radians, right? We have different units of angle that we might use to describe the, position, the same position of the phaser. What I'm going to propose for reasons that I hope will become clear is that we invent a new unit for angle. We're gonna call that unit accumulator units. And 
Much like there are 360 degrees in one rotation or two pi radians in one rotation, we're going to say there's two to the 32 accumulator units per rotation. The advantage of this, as is going to become hopefully even clearer, is that if there are two to the 32 units of accumulator in one rotation, then we can, in our code, store the position of that phaser in an unsigned int. As you're all aware, an unsigned int is 32 bits long. So what that means is that as this phaser rotates, what, the, what this illustration is showing us is two things. It's showing us the current position of the phaser in radians, and it's also showing us the current position of the phaser in accumulator units. And I have that represented in binary, just to show you that there's 32, um, uh, there are 32 binary values here. And what happens is that as the, as the accumulator ro rotates, the, the angle as reported by the accumulator units increases and increases and increases, and precisely at the, the positive real axis, it overflows. So the central observation here is that with a clever choice of units for angle, one rotation of a favor of a, a favor, a phaser is isomorphic to, which is to say it can be thought of as the overflow of a variable. So if we used an unsigned int to store the angle of this phaser in accumulator units, then when that variable overflows, that's the same as this, this phaser popping across the, the real axis here. The other advantage of this is the other isomorphism that exists as a consequence of this is adding, incrementing the value of that variable that we're using to hold the orientation of this phaser is the same as rotating the phaser. So say we have you know, some number stored in the, the variable, the unsigned int that we're using to represent the position of this phaser in accumulator units. If we add some amount to that, we increase its value by some amount. That's the same as rotating this by a little bit, right? We're rotating it to some new orientation. And if we add and add and add all the way until that value overflows, that's the same as rotating and rotating and rotating, and it overflows precisely here at the positive real axis. Does that central abstraction make some sense? So all we're doing is coming up with a new unit for angle. We're calling it accumulator units. We're going to say there's two to the 32 of those units per rotation. And the cleverness of this, what's interesting about this, is that allows for us to store the position of this in an unsigned int. Adding some amount to that unsigned int is the same as rotating this phaser. And when we add all the way up to two to the 32 and it overflows, the f that's, that's the phaser just popping right here over the positive real axis and continuing its rotation, right? So that's sort of the central clever observation at the bottom of this algorithm. So then as I mentioned, what I want to do is first talk through the steps of the algorithm, and then I'm going to go back through and justify some of these steps. I, I feel like it's nice to give you some context before we get into some of the details. So. As you're aware, or as you will become aware, it is the case that audio synthesis, the synthesis of audio, requires precise timing. That is to say, uh, it requires that you send new voltages to the DAC, which is ultimately communicating to a speaker, at a precise rate. The rate that we're going to use in lab one is 40 kilohertz. The reason, incidentally, that it requires precise timing is because your ears are sensitive instruments, and you will detect errors in timing. So there's no tricking yourself in this lab, which is kind of a nice feature of it, actually. If, if you're hitting timing requirements, you'll know. And if you're missing timing requirements, you'll know. Um, in order to achieve that timing, you're going to set up a timer interrupt exactly like we looked at last time. And I'm, again, I'm just going to remind you that incrementing that accumulator variable is the same as rotating the phaser. So all of this, all of this allows for us to synthesize a sine wave of a desired frequency in the following way. So these are the steps that you're going to follow in order to synthesize a sine wave. You will enter that repeating timer callback function. Remember last time we talked about how we set up these callback functions to be entered at some regular rate. So you'll set up a timer callback function to be entered at exactly 40 kilohertz. So you'll enter that timer callback. And then within the timer callback function, the first thing that you'll do is increment that accumulator, the variable that you're using to store the position of the phaser in accumulator units, you'll increment it by some amount. And remember that that's the same as it can be thought of as rotating the phaser. 
So you enter the timer interrupt, you increase the value of that accumulator variable a little bit, which is the same as rotating the phaser a little bit. You then look up the amplitude of the sine wave at that phaser angle. I mentioned previously that we're storing the amplitude of one period of a sine wave in an interarray. So you'll look at your accumulator value and say, OK, the phaser's at this position. I can go into my lookup table, and I know that when my phaser is at this angle, the amplitude of the sine wave is this. You grab it out of the sine table. You send that amplitude off to the DAC. Leave the repeating timer callback function, and then one over FS later, one over 40,000 seconds later, you re enter and you do this again. And the puzzle here is suppose that we want to synthesize a, a sine wave of a desired frequency. In order to achieve that output frequency, by how much should we increment the accumulator each time we enter the interrupt service routine or the timer callback function? And that is what the direct digital synthesis algorithm tells us. So that's what we're going to talk through. Questions about this? OK. So, so as I mentioned, the direct digital synthesis algorithm tells us, in order to achieve some desired output frequency, by how much should we increase the value of that accumulator every time we enter the interrupt, or every time we enter the timer callback? Um, if we increment it just a little bit, then you could imagine that that's rotating the phaser just a little bit. So this phaser is rotating more slowly, and we get a low frequency sine wave out. If we increase the value of that accumulator a lot every time we enter the interrupt service routine, that means we're rotating this phaser quite a lot every time we enter. So it's rotating faster, and we get a higher frequency sine wave out. So in order to achieve a goal frequency, exactly how much should we increment it? And of course, there's an equation that tells us this, but I thought it might be kind of instructive to see if we can arrive at this equation, like sort of intuitively. So let's start by supposing that every time we enter the timer interrupt or the timer callback function, we increase the value of that accumulator variable, the unsigned int that we're using to store the position of the phaser. We increased its value by one. If we did that, then what would be the frequency of the sine wave that we would get as an output? And we can answer this question through straightforward dimensional analysis. We're just going to change units. So we know that we have one sine period, which is the same as one overflow of that accumulator variable, every 2 to the 32 accumulator units. And we're, we're considering the case where every time we generate an audio sample in the timer callback function, we increment its value by exactly one unit, one accumulator unit. And furthermore, we know that we're going to do that. We're going to enter that timer interrupt at some rate that you specify when you set up the timer callback function. In lab one, it's going to be 40 kilohertz, 40,000 times a second. OK, so we have one sign period every 2 to the 32 accumulator units. Every time we enter the timer interrupt, we're going to increase the value of that accumulator by one unit, so one unit per audio sample. And we have FS, in our case 40,000, audio samples per second. So that means, changing all these units, we end up with a sine period, or a sine wave output with a period of FS, our sample rate, over 2 to the 32 hertz. 40,000 over 2 to the 32 in our particular case. How fast is that, or how slow is that? 40,000 divided by 2 to the 32. Oh, that's uh, what, like around 1 times 10 to the minus 5 hertz, which is approximately one period of the sine wave per day. So that's pretty slow. <laughs> Right in in lab one, you're going to be the crickets are chirping it. If I recall, I think it's 2,300 hertz, 2,300 hertz. So you'll be synthesizing um, sine waves that are considerably higher frequency than that. But you could synthesize sine waves with frequencies as low as one times ten to the minus fifth ish hertz using this sample rate and an accumulator of that size. But okay, so what if instead of incrementing the accumulator? by one unit every time we enter the timer interrupt, we instead increase its value by two units. We can go through exactly the same process. We have one sign period, one overflow for every two to the 32 accumulator units. 
This time, we're increasing its value by two every audio sample. And as before, we have FS 40,000 in our case, audio samples per second. That gives us an output sine wave with a, with a frequency of FS over two to the 32 times two hertz, twice as fast. And we're probably recognizing a pattern at this point, but suppose that we increase the value of that accumulator value by N units every time we enter the timer interrupt. In that case, going through exactly the same dimensional analysis, we would end up with a sine wave output that has a frequency of FS over two to the 32 times N, the amount by which we increased it, the accumulator's value hertz. Makes sense? So we have an unsigned int that we're using to store the position of that phaser. We enter the timer interrupt with the timer callback function and we increase its value by some amount. If we increase its value by N every time we enter the timer interrupt, then as a consequence, we'll get an output sine wave that has a frequency of FS over two to the 32 times N hertz. And you look at this equation and you can ask yourself, what, what are the knowns and the unknowns in this equation? So F out, we know th this, is the, this is the frequency that we want to synthesize. In your case for the crickets, it's gonna be 2300 hertz, I think. That's gonna be your desired F out. So you know that because that's what you want. You know FS, the sample rate, because you set up the timer callback function. You set up the timer interrupt and you'll configure it to be uh, 40 kilohertz in lab one. So you know this, you know this, you know two to the 32, it's just a parameter. We'll see where that comes from in just a second, but this is a consequence of the fact that we're using 32 bits to store our accumulator value. So the only thing we don't know here is n, the amount by which we're, in, we're incrementing the accumulator va um, value. So we can rearrange this equation and solve for n, n being the increment amount, and that we get, we get that the increment amount for some desired output frequency is that desired output frequency, for you it'll be 2300 hertz, over the sample rate, 40 kilohertz, times two to the 32. So if you want to synthesize a sine wave with some desired output frequency, and if you know your sample rate, and if you know how big your accumulator variable is that you're using to store the position of that phaser, this allows for you to solve for the amount by which you should increase the value of that accumulator every time you enter the interrupt in order to synthesize exactly the frequency that you want. Not exactly, but darn close, as we'll see in just a second. So for example, suppose that you want to produce middle C, as it turns out, it's 262 hertz. And suppose that you set up the timer interrupt to trigger at 44 kilohertz. So you set up your timer callback function so that 44,000 times a second, you entered this callback function and went through the process that we just laid out. The question is, by how much should you increment, increase the value of the accumulator each time you enter that timer callback function in order to produce middle C? So our desired F out is 262 hertz. In this particular example, we're supposing that we're synthesizing audio at 44 kilohertz times two to the 32 which gives us this value. So if every time we enter the timer interrupt, we increase the value of the accumulator by 25,574,577, we'll synthesize middle C to within a resolution that I'll show you, but it's to within like 10 to the minus fifth Hertz or so. Yeah. Is there a reason why you didn't round it to 78? No. <laughs> I should have. Yeah. Okay. So, so how well can we hit a target frequency? What's the resolution of this synthesizer? And we can reframe this question by asking, it's sort of asking a question that we already asked, which is um, how much frequency is contained within one accumulator unit? Does it make sense that if we're trying to hit a desired frequency, we can only do so to within the amount of frequency that is contained within one unit of the accumulator. We've actually already gone through this exercise, but we can solve for this where we say, okay, the resolution is going to be 
fs the sample rate over 2 to the 32 times in this case n is 1 one accumulator unit if we suppose an audio sample rate of 44 kilohertz then that gives us uh, a resolution of 10 to the minus fifth hertz which as i already said is about one period per day so it's it's really really close that's with a 32 bit accumulator Suppose instead of using an unsigned int, which has 32 bits, we instead used an unsigned short, which has 16 bits to store the position of that phaser. Okay, then our accumulator cannot achieve values up to two to the 32. It can achieve values up to two to the 16 before it then overflows. This reduces the resolution of our synthesizer. It saves us a handful of bits. It saves us 16 bits. But as a consequence, instead of being able to synthesize a goal frequency, a desired output frequency to within one times 10 to the minus fifth hertz, we can now only synthesize a desired output frequency to within 0.67 hertz. We'll see, I, I, I'm gonna try to clarify exactly why this happens in just a moment. What if instead of using an unsigned int or an unsigned short, we used a car, which only has eight bits? Well, in that case, our accumulator can only store values up to two to the eighth. We can go through the same exercise and now the resolution of our synthesizer is, is only 170 hertz, 171 hertz, which means if you want to synthesize middle C, 262 hertz, you'll only be able to hit it to within 170. It's awful. It, the, the resolution is terrible, right? So we benefit from having extra bits in our accumulator. Questions about this so far? We'll look at this code in code in just in just a moment as well, which with hope, which hopefully will add some clarity. Okay, so as I mentioned up here, up here, the steps in this algorithm include entering the timer callback. You increment the accumulator by however much is required in order to hit your target output frequency, and we just looked at how you compute that. Right? So you increment it by however much you have to in order to synthesize the frequency that you're after. You then look up the amplitude of the sine wave at that accumulator value, at that phaser value. And you look that up from a static array that lives in memory. In our case, the length of that array that we've chosen to use is 256 elements long, which means we've taken one period of a sine wave and broken it into 256 pieces and stored 256 samples of a sine wave. And I want to justify that length for a second because it might occur to you that if we're using a 32-bit variable to store the position of that phaser, if we're using an unsigned int to store the position of that phaser, then in principle, that phaser can assume two to the 32 different states. So you might, you might be tempted to think that we would require a sign table that is two to the 32 elements long. So that for every value of the accumulator, there would be an associated index of that table that we could go check to get the sine wave amplitude. In fact, thank, thankfully, because otherwise this wouldn't be very practical, we don't need nearly that many entries in the sign table. We can get away with way less. Um, and I'm going to show you the consequence here in just a moment of increasing the amount of samples in that sign table. So what we're seeing here is the case where we're supposing for the moment that we only had eight samples in that sign table. As it turns out, the DAC that we're using acts like a zeroth order hold. That is to say, you send it a voltage and it keeps outputting that voltage until you send it a new voltage. Right. So if we were to send it a sine wave, we would send it the first sample from that uh, array which contains all the amplitudes of the sine wave, it would keep outputting that until we sent it the next one and the next one and the next one. And in the case of only eight table entries, we end up with the sort of blocky squared off approximation to a sine wave. And what we're looking at beneath this is the associated power spectrum for this wave. Now you may remember from what class? Signals of some variety? the power spectrum of what we really have here is a slow sine wave being modulated by a fast square wave 
what you end up with when you look at the power spectrum is the fundamental frequency is at one, one period. And then we have all these error harmonics. And these error harmonics come from the fact that this isn't a pure sine wave. It's a squared off approximation to the sine wave. And in particular, you can see that the first error harmonic is it remains at about the number of entries in the table minus one. So if this is at one, the first error harmonic in the case of eight table entries is at about seven times the fundamental. So if we were synthesizing 100 hertz, the first error harmonic would be at about 700 hertz. And these are in log units. So one log unit is 20 decibels. What I'm going to do when I play this animation is increase the number of entries in the sign table. And what you'll observe in the power spectrum is that the fundamental remains at one period, because we still have one period of a sine wave. But the first error harmonic is going to move away from the fundamental. It's going to move to higher frequencies. And it's going to become attenuated, less loud, as compared to the fundamental. I'll show you this. So the number of table entries is increasing. The first error fundamental is moving, the, the first error harmonic rather is moving away and down. So the more entries that you have in the sine table, the less harmonic distortion you have in the output sine wave. If you only have eight and you try to synthesize, say, middle C, you're going to hear middle C and you're also going to hear seven times middle C, and then you're going to hear the other error harmonics. If you have a lot more entries in the sign table, say you have, you know, 256, then that error harmonic when you're synthesizing middle C is at over 120 times the fundamental frequency. You can do the math, but it's a, it's a lot of hertz, and it's way attenuated. So exactly how big your sign table is depends on your requirements. And it, particularly, it depends on what are your requirements in connection to the error harmonics. How much error harmonic are you willing to accept? In lab one, your requirement is it has to sound like a cricket, <laughs> which is a little squishy, but we can make it a, a, little more, uh, a, a little more rigorous in that a way you might interpret that is the first error harmonic needs to be inaudible, cannot be able to hear it. Does anybody know the highest frequency? Well, it's different for everybody, but approximately the highest frequency that people approximately your age can typically hear. It's about 20 kilohertz. Yeah, it's about 20 kilohertz. I tested myself before lecture. I'm at 18. Um, you might consider testing yourself. It's actually, it's one of these interest, if you care about some things, it's interesting to study your body as an engineered system, learn about the sensors and the limitations of those sensors. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a fun exercise. Once a year, go through and figure out your cutoff frequency for audio and track it throughout your life because it will change. As you age, your cutoff frequency gets lower and lower and lower. Uh, right now, I'm at about 18. A few decades from now, it's going to be maybe 10. Yeah, it, it drops and it drops. Um, but in any case, that, that, that you, if you figure out your cutoff frequency, that tells you about how big the sign table needs to be, right? You say, OK, I can't hear anything above this frequency anyway. If there's an error harmonic, no one's going to hear it. And furthermore, it's going to be so attenuated that we probably wouldn't hear it in any case. So, which is just to say that you could keep the number of table entries in that sign table at 256 and it's going to sound spot on. It's going to sound just right. I'm going to talk next about how we actually index into that sign table. Are there any questions about this before I move on? Okay. So, as I've mentioned previously, the steps of this algorithm are to enter the interrupt service routine or the timer callback function, increase the amount of the accumulator by, by however much you need to in order to get your desired output frequency. You solve for that using the equation that you looked at. So that's the same as rotating this phaser a little bit. And then you use that phaser position to look up the amplitude of the sine wave um, from a lookup table. Suppose you use a 256, it, you suppose you use a sign table that is 256 elements long, then you can index into any, you can get into any index of that sign table using eight bits, right? In eight bits, you can represent numbers up to 256. So, but we have 32 bits in our accumulator variable. 
So the way to translate from a value of the accumulator, which is being used to store the position of the phaser, to an index of the sign array, an easy way to do it is to just use the most significant eight bits of the accumulator. So when we look at the code in a moment, what we're going to see is that when we access the, the uh, sign table, we do so, the index that we access is the value of the accumulator right shifted by 24. We truncate out all these 24 bits and just index into the top eight most significant. Something that always bothers people about this algorithm is that if we only need eight bits to get into the sign table, what's the point of all the extra ones? And, and maybe it's the case that the discussion that we just had about the resolution of this synthesizer and how that changes as a consequence of the amount of bits that you're using to track phaser angle, maybe that helps answer this question a little bit. But a, a way to think of, another way to think about this accumulator variable is supposing that you have a 256 element sign array. What this is telling us is, a way to interpret this is, the most significant eight bits of this accumulator are telling us which index to access of that sign array. And the least significant 24 bits are keeping track of fractional amounts of index of that sign array. Because it may be the case, if you're trying to synthesize a particularly low frequency wave, that you send the same index from that sign wave, or from that table rather, a few times in a row, and then you go to the next index, you send that a few times in a row, and so on and so on. It's okay to access the same index of the sign array a few samples in a row. That's the way that this works. But what you want is to be able to move to the next index at precisely the right sample. By keeping track of fractional amounts of index, it allows for us to do that. So suppose we're incrementing the accumulator in such a way that maybe, um, how to describe this? You know, it takes 10 interrupts in order for this bit to change. So we would send the same sample of the sign array out to the DAC, 10 samples in a row, but on the 11th, it would pop to the next one. Keeping track of fractional amounts of index allows for that transition to the next element of the sign table to occur at exactly the right time, which is what gives us the resolution. So it may be the case that you send the same sample from the sign table to the DAC multiple times in a row. It may alternatively be the case that you skip samples. And that's okay too. If you're trying to synthesize a particularly high frequency wave, you may go from sample zero to five to 10 to 15, which as a consequence gives you a higher frequency output. That's okay as long as you're skipping the correct number of samples. And again, keeping track of fractional amounts of index allows for you to do that. As long as you have like eight to 16 samples per sine wave to keep down that harmonic distortion that we were just looking at. Okay, so some common questions about this. This, by the way, well, I'll get to that in a second. What I was going to say is one of the problems with this algorithm is when I introduce it to folks, it seems too simple. <laughs> and it, when we look at it in code, it seems that it's too, it, it shouldn't work, but it does work. So some common questions. This one I already talked about. If we're only using eight bits to index into a sign table, why do we need more than eight bits? Um, it's so that you can send the same sample from the sign table the correct number of times, or you can skip the correct number of entries in the sign table. It gives us additional resolution. It gives the synthesizer resolution. Okay, another question. Suppose you wanted to improve the output waveform. That is to say, you wanted to get rid of some of the error harmonics, but for some reason, maybe you're unbelievably memory constrained, you can't afford to increase the length of your sign table. One thing that you could do is put an RC low pass filter between the DAC output and the speaker, right? And you, you get to decide where the cutoff frequency for that, uh, for that filter is, but you know, you would put it maybe here, right? So it passes the fundamental and attenuates out the error harmonics. And then for the cost of a couple of extra components, you can reduce your error harmonics without increasing the length of your sign table. 
Now that said, our sign table is only 256 elements long. It costs you like a kilobyte. Right? It's not consuming that many resources. But there may be some applications where you're crazy memory constrained and it's just worthwhile to note that there are hardware solutions to dealing with these error harmonics in addition to software solutions. Depending what you're doing, you might favor one or the other. Okay. Questions about this? So let's just peek back at the code for a moment. Question. Yeah. So is that we're you using a lookup table instead of using mathematical like uh, formula for this? Is it only because of the uh, performance constraints? It's it's way faster. Way way faster. Okay. Let, let's look at this in code. So this is this is the example that we looked at last time. I'll just briefly remind you that. Uh, this is synthesizing a pure tone. We bring in a few includes, declare some parameter values. I waved my hands at these parameter values last time, but now they should look familiar. Two to the 32, that's because that's required. We, we need that parameter in order to compute the increment value. And FS is gonna be our sample rate. We're using 40 kilohertz in this case. Phase acume main, this is where we're going to store the phaser position. You can see that it's an unsigned int. And phase increment main, this is the amount by which we are going to increase the value of this variable every time we enter the timer callback. And you can see that we are setting this equal to 800 times 2 to the 32 over FS, which you'll remember from the, the equation that we were just looking at. This is telling us how much we should increment in order to synthesize 800 hertz. If you wanted to instead synthesize 400 hertz, you'd replace this with a 400. If you wanted 2300 hertz, you'd replace this with a 2300. Okay, and then down in main, we initialize standard I.O., print a greeting, set up and configure an SPI channel, map those SPI signals to GPIO ports. We then populate that sign table, that sign array, so you can see that we go from zero up to sign table size, which if we looked up above, that would be 256. And we're populating it with the, the amplitude of the sign. We're dividing one period of a sine wave into 256 bits, and we're populating this array with those amplitudes. Why multiply by 247? It's a 12-bit DAC, which means it outputs voltages in the range of it can, it can, uh, we can send it digital values to convert to a voltage that are in the range of zero to two to the 12th, zero to 4,096. So we're scaling this such that the spot, the sine wave goes from positive 2047 to negative 2047. When we actually send it, then we'll level shift it up to zero to 4,096. But it's just kind of nice. If you're doing math with anything sine related, it's kind of nice to keep it centered on zero. So we should save that level shift for the last step. But in any case, we populate the sign table and then we set up that repeating timer so that we can schedule some code to run every 40 kilohertz. And the code that runs, we enter the timer callback function. The first thing that we do is increment the value of the accumulator. We're increasing the value of phase accumulate main by the value of that phase increment, which we computed to be whatever it needs to be to synthesize 800 hertz. And then, we populate this variable DAC data, which is the 16-bit value that we're going to actually send to the DAC, with the value at the index of the sign table given by the phase accumulator, the accumulator variable, right shifted by 24, looking at the most significant eight bits. And then the last step here, we add 2048, just to level shift it up to the, uh, the acceptable range for the DAC. And incidentally, we're masking that with that that config channel A, which you'll recall, um, this will end up being 12 bits, and then we're masking in the top four control bits of the DAC for that transaction. We send that value off to the DAC. One over 40,000 seconds later, we come back and we do the same thing again. So what you'll do, just pull up what you'll do this week in lab is you are going to look at cricket chirps. Oh. 
By the way, you're going to be looking at specifically this cricket in this video's chirp. And the reason why it's specifically this cricket is, as those of you that have been reading the lab know, they change their frequency as a function of temperature. So it's actually kind of fun if you're sitting outside in an evening and you're listening to the crickets, you can time them with your watch and it gives you a pretty good approximation of the ambient temperature. So in any case, we're synthesizing this cricket. I don't know what temperature he's living in, but in any case. Um, and by, by using an oscilloscope to look at the audio output of this video, we can figure out, okay, what's the waveform that composes a cricket chirp? And as it turns out, it's a bunch of amplitude modulated pure frequencies with a frequency of, I think I said 2300 hertz. So if you're looking for a way to start your checkout this week, what's the best way to start? What I would recommend is you take that beep boop example, which is synthesizing, I think, a 400 hertz wave out of one channel and an 800 hertz wave out of another channel. Modify that such that instead of synthesizing 400 and 800 hertz, it's instead synthesizing 2300 hertz. Then you've got the frequency aspect down. Then what you might consider doing is change the time of those beeps and boops so that it's correct for one syllable of the cricket chirp here. So just with some relatively simple modifications of the existing demo code, you can get the Pico to generate a whole bunch of these syllables. It won't sound right because you won't have the timing just right just yet, but it'll sound like a bunch of, uh, like a really spastic cricket. It's just gonna be a cricket going crazy. And then you go in and you slightly modify the state machine that exists in the two interrupt service routines that live on each core of the Raspberry Pi Pico so that you modulate this on and off with the appropriate timing so that it actually sounds like a cricket, okay? So let me just summarize. Direct digital synthesis is an algorithm that allows for you to synthesize a waveform of a desired frequency with alarming accuracy, frankly. And the central abstraction is to notice that if we come up with our, our own new unit of angle called accumulator units, and we say there's two to the 32 of those units per rotation, that has this nice consequence that if we store that value, that accumulator value in an unsigned int, then adding to that unsigned int is the same as rotating this phaser. And it's perfectly okay to add until it overflows. And because there's exactly the appropriate amount of units in this rotation, the overflow just, pop, it just keeps on rotating, right? There's no error associated with that. There's some really interesting things you can do with this. Really interesting things. For example, what I've talked through today is how you synthesize a single desired frequency. You can modulate the desired output frequency as a function of time. So you can say, start by, by synthesizing 400 hertz, and then as it runs, smoothly ramp it up to 1,000 hertz. And it's going to sound like, boop, like the, the frequency will just go up, right? And you can play games with this, like, let's see here. For example, you could go to the ornithology website, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have an unbelievable repository of birdsong spectrograms. This is showing you the frequency content of a birdsong. You can make a direct digital synthesizer that tracks these frequencies and synthesizes them. This was a lab last year. And you get stuff that sounds, I mean, just like a bird, right? Exactly like a bird. The other interesting thing that you can do, so I've, I've had a few students experiment with this in various ways. Um, another thing that we did was you can, hold on just a second, I'm gonna pull up this project. Uh, past to MN project. So I had a couple of MN students that were playing with this. I had one student, so, so you, can, you can synthesize a pure frequency, you can modulate that frequency. The other thing that you can do is set up multiple direct digital synthesis synthesizers so that one is synthesizing one frequency, another is synthesizing another frequency, and you play them simultaneously, and what you hear is both. Right? So you can compose a whole bunch of frequencies. I had one MN student last year, a couple years ago, 
who was a chimes master, played the Cornell chimes, really into bells. So for his MEng project, he took an audio recording of bell strikes, did a frequency analysis of that to figure out, okay, in this sound, what are the frequencies that are present? What's their relative amplitudes? And what are their relative decay rates? The fundamental decays at a different rate than the error harmonics and all the error harmonics decay at different rates. It's a hard problem to actually solve. But then he generated a bunch of direct digital synthesis synthesizers and had each synthesizer be responsible for a different one of those frequencies and to decay at different rates. And this is what the real bell sounds like. This is a, synth a purely artificial bell. Just with a bunch of direct digital synthesis synthesizers added together. The other fun thing that you can do, there's all kinds of fun things that you can do, is um, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent. That's okay. The, the other fun thing that you can do is there's this interesting feature of uh, the brain where it is sometimes the case that your ears are better at discerning patterns than your eyes. And researchers in a variety of disciplines have exploited this fact to try to find patterns in complicated data sets. So one particular example of this that I think is pretty cool is you can take the DNA sequence, all the base pairs in the DNA sequence, and associate each, uh, what is, it's an amino acid, right? That's the fundamental building block. You, see, you associate each of those with a frequency, and then you play all the frequencies so that instead of looking at the DNA strand represented on paper as A's and T's and U's and G's and so on, you can listen to it. And your ear can pick up some patterns in that DNA sequence that are very difficult for your eyes to pick up. I had, I had another master's student that we were puzzling over this and thinking, well, if, if the ear is, is good at recognizing patterns, is it also good at recognizing mathematical chaos? Can it listen to a system and go, that's a chaotic system? And to try to figure this out, we didn't figure anything out, but it was fun to try. <laughs> um, to try to figure this out, we took a very famous chaotic system, the Lorenz system, beautiful blood butterfly, strange attractor, and mapped position in physical space to frequencies so that we could listen to the chaotic system. And it sounds like this. It's kind of spooky, right? But one, one interesting consequence was if you, if you played with the frequencies just right and the speed of that just right, it sounded exactly like a mosquito buzzing around. Uh, I don't know what that suggests or if it even suggests anything. Um, the other fun thing that you can do, this is, we're starting to get sort of into maybe final project hallucination ideas, is you may remember from Waves class that if you, uh, if you were to look at the frequency content of a plucked string, the harmonics are just beautifully stacked. There's a fundamental, and then there's almost uh, no power in some region frequencies. There's the first harmonic, almost no power, another harmonic, and they stack the whole way up with diminishing amplitude. So you can set up a bank of direct digital synthesis synthesizers to hit the fundamental and every error harmonic, not error harmonic, harmonics, there aren't errors, and get beautiful um, simulations of things like violins, guitars, other stringed instruments. Um, there's actually, uh, for the stringed instruments, there's a, uh, a little hack called the Carpless Strong algorithm which if you're interested in synthesizing uh, those sorts of instruments, I might refer you to. It's, it's cheaper and it produces really, really nice simulations of these things. Invented by a former Cornell guy, um, ultimately went to Stanford. Okay. Any questions about this algorithm? So my plan for the next couple of days is, is you know, we're, we're, what I'm trying to do here is ultimately get us to the point where you can look at the demo code for this week's checkout, which is given here. And we will have talked about pretty much every aspect of it so that it all looks familiar. The gaps that I had yet to fill in are multi-core. How do we get code to run on core zero or core one as opposed to core zero? Turns out that's actually pretty easy, but I'm gonna talk about that on Wednesday. I have to talk about proto threads which is the threading environment that we're going to be using. I'm going to introduce that on Wednesday as well. And 
uh, fixed point arithmetic, which I may not get to on Wednesday. That might have to wait till Friday, but I think that you'll be okay in lab in any case. Um, that's what all this stuff is. What we're doing here is creating our own new data type, which we're calling fix 15 in the way that an int is a data type, a short is a data type. We're creating our own data type that we're calling fix 15 and redefining things like multiplication and division and stuff for this data type. I'll talk about this in detail on Friday, but the advantage of this is it allows for us to keep track of to do arithmetic with fractional resolution numbers like 1.02 which you can't do with an int, right? Um, but it allows for us to do that with integer arithmetic, which as you're all likely aware is way faster on this heart, on, on this device at least than floating point. That's important for labs like this because you're synthesizing audio at 40 kilohertz. Your processor's running at 125 megahertz. That means you have 125, 125 million divided by 40,000, which is something around 3,000 cycles to spend per audio sample. So you have, to, you have to finish computing the next voltage that you're going to send to the DAC in 3,000 cycles or less, or you will not meet your timing deadlines. Using fixed point as opposed to floating point saves you a whole bunch of cycles. Okay, so that's the advantage of using this. And again, we'll talk through that this week. Okay. I will see you all on Wednesday.